Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back. And I know I promised that I would make first of all a video on Old Rusty, but my MGB GT has to get to the track this weekend and we do have a problem with it. The last time the car was on the track is about five months ago. And since then it hasn't been used, so I was trying to prepare it this morning to get it back ready for the track this weekend. And unfortunately, I can't get it started. Well, it's extremely hard to get it started. And once it's started, it runs very rough. So in this video, I'm going to take you through every single step that I'm going to do to check out this complete engine because I don't know what is really wrong with it. Uh, the engine is slightly modified, so the block itself has been um, enlarged to 1950cc. We've got a tuned and modified stage 3 cylinder head uh, with larger valves. The intake valves are 45, 44mm and the outlet valve is 36mm. We've got a DCOE carburetor on it with a special intake manifold. We also have pistons that are now 83 millimeters and uh, we have a modified camshaft and the camshaft is the 720 SP from Kent. So this is a race uh, camshaft and all of that together um, creates about 165 horsepower on this car with a maximum speed of about 195 clicks an hour. Now you might not believe me on this but uh, here are my torque sheets that we have done on the dyno and you can actually see how high we get up. The actual torque that we have on the wheels in the back is about 101 horsepower because I'm losing about 50 horsepower. The first thing I always do is check the oil. It tells you a lot about the engine. So looking at the oil on this engine, I can tell that there are no strange deposits on it. There's no white foam on it. If you do have white foam, on it, that would mean that you have actually a water leak into your oil system. That would be not very good. So most likely you would have a broken seal somewhere or even a blown head gasket. And I can see we got ample of cooling liquid inside, so there's no cooling leak. That with the oil and the cooling liquid, okay. My next step will be to check the compression on every cylinder. I expect to have about 12 kilograms at least. And for that, you're going to need a compression meter. So this is going to be cylinder number one. So on the first cylinder, we have roughly about 13 and a half kilograms, which is pretty good. I'm just putting this in hand tight. It's looking good. So the last one. Well, let's see what we got here, guys. So we've got 13 and a half kilograms. So all four cylinders are now producing the proper compression. So I have no real valve problem. I have compression. So the next step would be to check the ignition. But before I do so, I'm going to check actually the valves because the valve timing might be off a bit. And we may have actually a valve which is stuck, who knows. So let's take off the valve cover, have a look on that. And then we get back to the ignition. By the way, uh, what you see here is the spill tank, which you must have if you drive on the track. It would be nice to have a cross flow head, but this is not the case. Here we have the modified head with the larger inlet valves, uh, 44 mil, larger outlet valves, 36 millimeters, but we also have what we call rollers on top of it. Uh, the rockers are now rollers and there's a little wheel here that sits on the top of the valve stem. This is great stuff, uh, especially for higher RPMs. So this is a stage three head. I also have double springs here, strong springs. So the valves uh, are more under pressure to close. Um, 
So the reason I have this opened up is to see that the valves are having the right play at the right time. Now, I know that more or less already because of the compression test, but I still want to see that the timing on the valves is more or less right. The camshaft that drives the push rods in the back here, this is the 720 uh, SP from Kent. It's a race uh, camshaft. So I'm going to rotate the engine and then I'm going to check with the long screwdriver through this hole here where the uh, spark plugs fit. Um, when the piston is at top that center, and then I will see what the valves are doing. So I just want to make sure that the sequence of the valves is right. On most engines, you're going to find a marking mechanism to identify the amount of degrees of advance you have. And that is typically on the casing, and here you have the different teeth. And at the same time, you will find a marking somewhere on this pulley um, if you want to set this up really properly, then you have to dial in your camshaft. Uh, but that's going to be another video. But in this case, we are trying to fix this engine. So I'm going to rotate it uh, with this big socket here, and then we'll see what happens. And at the same time, we're going to watch the valves. So I'm going to start with the first cylinder, and we're keeping an eye on those two valves right here. And um, right now, I can see that the exhaust valve is actually depressed. So. Let's see what happens. So now the piston should be coming up. Inlet valve should open up. So now we have intake. And now we should be at the bottom end because now the inlet valve is closing. And now we should be at the compression stroke. And let's see where my piston is. Oh, it's still quite deep. Let's see what happens. I can feel it coming up. And I'm watching at the same time the marking there that we have. So now we are almost at top that center. It's a bit hard to identify it exactly because you have kind of a dwell effect. And I see the marking on the engine itself uh, as about six degrees advance. Now those two valves should now be really having play. And they have quite a bit of play. This play is probably way too much, but right now I'm not going to worry about it. Now I'm going to repeat this for every cylinder and making sure that every rocker is working properly. I have seen nothing wrong with this engine. We've done a compression test. That looked all good. We looked on the rockers. We looked on the push rods. We looked even at the valve timing to some extent, and that all is looking quite good. The oil is clean and the cooling liquid is in. So now the next step is to look at either the ignition system, because many things can go wrong with the ignition, and we might have to look on the carburation system, so the carburetor and the fuel pump. And if all that is good, then the car should start. So now it's time to look at the ignition system and see what's going on. A lot of things can go wrong with the ignition. We've got an ignition coil. We've got a amplifier because this car has an electronic ignition. We've got our distributor with the rotor inside and the optocoupler. And then we have the high tension leads and of course the spark plugs. And then finally we have the ignition timing. Does it spark at the right time at the right cylinder? So this is something we really need to sort out and find out uh, if all this is working. So we're gonna take this step by step. Well, here we have the high tension leads going to the spark plugs and those we have already removed as you have seen before. So I'm not going to talk about the spark plugs, although I could talk for probably a couple of hours on spark plugs, but that's not the intent of this video. Then over here, we've got our distributor and then we have our high tension coil. And here is our amplifier. Now, the ignition coil on this car is supposed to be a high-performance ignition coil. Now, some of them have a resistor in front and others not. That depends on the impedance. So, checking the ignition system is very simple. There are a couple of elements that you need to know on how they work. So, inside this distributor, we don't have breaker points. I have an optocoupler, which is an LED light, which is emitting light, and on the other side, we have a receiver and there are blades passing through that and each time a blade passes through that light beam, it will cut the light. When the blade has passed, the light is back onto the receiver 
and that is creating a pulse. Now that pulse is then fed to the amplifier module. The amplifier module that amplifies the pulse and drives power to your ignition coil. When the power is removed from the ignition coil, based on the pulsing that is happening by the optocouple through the amplifier, then there is an induction in the coil and then you get a spark. So what I'm going to do now is to remove the distributor cap. I'm only going to connect the spark plug to the high tension lead on the ignition coil. I will turn on the contact and I will manually block the light on the optocoupler. And then I remove the blocking and then we should see some sparks happening if everything is okay. We don't know yet at this stage because we could still have a problem with the amplifier and we could still have a problem with the optocoupler or we could have a problem with the ignition coil. Now some cars don't have an optocoupler, they have something else, they have a Hall effect switch which is a bit of a different mechanism. I don't really like optocouplers because they tend to fade over time, they tend to have some issues. Uh, nevertheless, let's start and see what happens. Here goes that connector, um, which is coming from the high tension lead. That's where I'm going to connect my spur plug to. And I will now remove the distributor cap. And let's see how easy that is, because sometimes that can be a little bit of a pain in the butt. Here we go. And of course, we'll do an inspection on the distributor cap very soon. So I'm going to take the rotor off. And what you see here, this part right here, this is our optocoupler. It's an LED, as I said before, and a receiver. And each time these little blades here are passing through that opening, they will actually cause an interruption in the light. And that will then cause a pulse. And the pulse is then fed to the amplifier, as I explained before. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is turn on the ignition. And then I'm going to block the light manually myself. And I should see a spark. I have the ignition on and you can hear the fuel pump. This is my little tool that I'm going to block things with. And each time I do this, I can see the spark on my spark plug. As you have seen, we have a proper spark. So that means that the optocoupler is working and it's doing its job. The amplifier is amplifying the pulse and drives current through the ignition coil. And the ignition coil seems to be able to cause induction to the secondary winding, producing the final spark. So all that seems to be working just fine. Now it's no guarantee that this is going to work when the engine is hot, but the problem I'm having is that the engine doesn't even start when it's cold. But what would I do if I had uh, no spark? Well, in that case, I would actually first check my uh, 12 volts coming to my ignition coil. You should see on the ignition coil a plus sign, and that's where there should be 12 volts each time the ignition is turned on. Measure that with a voltmeter. If it's not there, then find out where it is. Maybe have a blown fuse. The other thing is that you can check the ignition coil in the way it is by removing the negative wire on the negative connector on the ignition coil Remove that completely from your amplifier module, so the amplifier module is no longer connected to the ignition coil. And then ground very quickly that negative connector on the ignition coil. Just do it quick, on and off, on and off. That should cause sparks, basically, on the spark plug. If it doesn't, then your ignition coil is faulty. Now, in terms of the amplifier module itself, there is not a lot you can do about it. But make sure that the connector which is going to the optocoupler in the uh, distributor, that that connector is properly sealed and that you have also 12 volts going to that optocoupler because it's going to need 12 volts to create that light on the LED. So measure that out as well. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, you can do no more than that. Uh, you could check the optocoupler in this case, uh, but for that you would need to have a little oscilloscope so you could hook up the oscilloscope to the output of the uh, optocoupler and then see if you have actually a pulse. So these are all small things you can do. I'm not going to do them now because I don't have that problem on that car. I have my spark. So now I'm going to check a couple of other components. The next thing I want to do is to check out the condition of the distributor head or cap. And, of course, the spark plug leads. Uh, the spark plug leads will measure out with an ohmmeter. I will also check the rotor itself, uh, making sure that it makes no shorts. 
so measuring out the sparkler cleats is not very complicated. Um, I'm just using an ohmmeter, and I guess everybody knows an ohmmeter. And I'm just going to ohm out uh, wire by wire and see what we got. And I'm going to leave them on the distributor. That makes it a bit more realistic. And then I'm going to measure one at a time and see what impedance we have. All right. Okay. And here I have um, 0.6 ohms, as you can see. So I'm going to do one by one and see if we have good contact. So this is a electrified horse fence uh, generator, and it generates about 7 kilovolts. So let me plug that in, and that's what I'm using, actually, to test out the rotor. And as you can see, we've got roughly 7.5 kilovolts. See? So this is like your ignition. And I'm going to show you that power is on. There you go. So now I'm going to go inside and see if we have any sparks moving around. And nothing is happening there. If this was a faulty rotor, then you would see sparks happening. And then it would arc out towards the frame uh, of your car or your engine. Uh, so that would be no good. So this rotor hat is good. I'm not going to do the same thing with my distributor hat. So here we have the distributor cap, and as you can see, we are arcing. And I've put in a power to one of the uh, high tension, it's going to one of the spark plugs. And if I go inside, I should have a spark on that specific one. There you go. But I should have no sparks anywhere around. And that's exactly what I wanted to see. So I'm going to do this for each of those spark plug positions, and then the rotor head should be good. And the last test is the cable coming normally from the ignition coil into the uh, distributor head in the center. And wow, I have no sparks. I should have a spark here because there is supposed to be a connection here to the rotor head. So this looks like we're having a faulty distributor head. Well, I'd be damned. Look at this middle part here. There's supposed to be a part there which is resting actually on the top of the rotor itself, and that is missing. So the whole time when this engine was trying to start up, we just got arcs jumping over. No wonder it wouldn't start. So now I'm missing a part, so I got to find a way to fix this somehow. Not sure how, but let me see if I can find some pieces and see if we can put it together and then see what the car does. So, I'm not sure if I will be able to get a part right now, but I have still a V8 distributor. And let's have a look inside this cap here. You see that little part here? It's spring-loaded. That's the one I need. That's the one which is missing right here. I don't know if I can recover it. Probably not. I probably have to get a new um, distributor head. But let me try to recover that one from this distributor because the V8 is gone anyway. And then see if we can get this to work. If this is the real problem, but this seems to be an issue. I don't know how that happened. This is weird. So that's the part I just pulled out of the other distributor cap. Uh, it's very small, but let's see if we can get it in. And it does. So let's uh, put the car together. And I know I need to buy a new part for this, but I just want to make sure that this is the real problem on the car. I suspect it is, but then again, you never know. I don't know what it is, but I always liked MGB GTs. They always kind of appealed to me. I have to admit, this has been a pretty weird problem. I'm just going to put the rocker cover on for now, so we don't spill too much oil out. Well, that doesn't seem to work yet. Whoops.
as you probably noticed, the engine isn't running all that good. It, it's not running on all four cylinders. That's at least the impression I have, although the compression is good on all four. So we must have an issue, most likely either with the spark plugs or uh, with the carburetor. The carburetor on this car is a double barrel DCOE 45 from Weber. And these are typically very good carburetors. And one barrel is feeding cylinders one and two, and the other barrel is feeding cylinders three and four. So I have the engine running and if I pull off the spark plug on cylinder number three, there is no difference on how the engine runs. And the same thing goes for spark plug number four or cylinder number four. However, if I do the same on cylinder number one, it almost stops, right, as you can see. If I do this on cylinder number two, it stops really. So what this tells me is that cylinders number three and four are having a problem. And the funny thing is that cylinders three and four are fed by the same barrel of the same carburetor. Cylinders one and two are fed by the other barrel of the carburetor. So I suspect that something is wrong with the Weber. So I'm going to take the carburetor off the engine so we can do a full inspection on it. And those of you that have seen my videos on the Weber carburetor, DCOEs, then that is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the float level, I'm going to look at all the jets, making sure that everything is okay and then we'll put it back and it should be okay. Because I'm not going to mess around um, with trying to adjust things when the carburetor is on the engine because, you know, you, you never know what state it is in. So it's always better to do a complete and good job on that instead of just, you know, doing a hurry scurry thing. Now Webbers don't like vibration, that's why you have these um, special seals in here with a rubber ring on it. And also uh, there's a rubber ring that goes on here mounting the Weber to the intake manifold just because they hate vibrations. So I'm going to take the carburetor apart. I'm going to start by taking the top cover off, then have a look inside, look at all the filters, look at all the channels, making sure that everything is set as it's supposed to be set. Um, checking the progression holes and all that and then hopefully um, we'll find something and then we can get it all sorted out. And to get it cleaned up I'm using brake cleaner that always works fine. I'm just going to spray on it and then use a soft brush uh, just to clean up. And here's that soft brush. I'm not trying to make something really shiny here. I'm just like to get most of the debris off. It is quite some. And especially around the, um, the jets, uh, you want to make sure that you don't have any debris because otherwise you're going to get all that crap inside the um, actual carburetor. And that's not something you want. And, you're probably going to be worse off than I started. If you want to see on how you need to disassemble a Weber carburetor and how to set up a baseline, I recommend that you watch one of my videos on this. I think I have about four or five videos on this topic. If I now was to open up the butterflies and you can see how it squirts, this is the acceleration pump and that works real well. I'm just going to blow air through the carburetor now uh, as it would be sucking in air and then we'll see what happens if we get actually um, fuel through it. And that works. And that works. So what we know is that the main jets are working, that the emulsion tubes are working. This is our float and I will check the float in a few minutes. And now I have all the jets that I can remove. These are all the jets that came out of the carburetor and uh, 
we're going to clean them all up. And as you can see, I kept the left and right exactly uh, as they were in the carburetor. But first of all, I'm going to clean up the channels now in the carburetor by blowing it through with some compressed air. I have cleaned up all the channels in the carburetor and all the jets. I placed it all back where it was. It's still not adjusted, but I have more or less the mixture screws in the right position. We'll do that once it's back on the car. So the first thing is now to check the needle valve. And for that, I'm just going to hook it up to the fuel line, turn on the ignition so the electrical pump will pump up because these pumps provide quite some pressure and see what happens uh, if the needle valve actually is able too close, uh, that fuel stream. And for that, I'm gonna put a bucket underneath because it might be a little bit messy otherwise. And fuel is actually filling up the pot now and see what happens with the float. You can hear the difference in the pump, right? When it closes up. There's quite a bit of fuel delivery. So next I'm going to check actually the float and I'm just going to lift it up vertical like this and it should just be touching the needle valve and then the distance from the cover to the float, not considering the seal, should be about 12 millimeters and that's about right. And then in the full droop, that should then be 12, uh, 26 millimeters in the middle. So let's see. And that's about right. So I have no issue with this and I can fit it back together and then we'll, we'll try it out and see if we have fixed the problem. I haven't really seen anything wrong, but then again, small little blockages um, are hard to see, but everything is now blown through. So it should be all right. So I have reinstalled the carburetor and I have already done some very basic adjustments and for that I would like to refer you to my other video where we are adjusting the base settings of the Weber carburetor. I still have to fine tune the ignition of course, but as you will see the engine is running a hell of a lot better now. Let me show you. So let's see what the effect is. See that? Cylinder number three. Now that's perfect. So folks, we have come to the end of this video. And as you have seen, uh, we had just a small problem on the distributor cap, a missing part. I don't know what happened with that. This is so weird, but who knows? Um, but that's fixed. The other thing we had is a problem with the carburetor. The right hand barrel was kind of having a clogging on the idle channel and the progression channel. That is now cleaned up, but that seems to be working just fine. And uh, I still need to adjust the valves. That's still one more thing I need to do. And it will probably change as well the ignition system with a one, two, three ignition so I can program the advance and vacuum curves because on this one, I cannot do it and it might just help to get a couple more of horsepower out of it. Thank you for viewing, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.